Anyway, I'm sorry that I didn't translate this. That's the, that was the point of this whole um, little def <laughs> defense speech. Uh, but some of it is. Uh, the point is um, that I will talk to you a little bit now about a topic that is increasingly um, researched in sports sciences. And it is uh, also becoming more and more interesting um, as, um, as a pra practical subject, if we can say that. Uh, I don't know, already some of you talked about it. You talked about Brazilian, Brazilian uh, programs, community programs that are aiming to create better lives with people or for people and children in particular. Um, and this has grown to become so big that it has actually been termed a movement that has grown in recent years which is called Sport for Development and Peace. Have you heard that word? Sport for Development and Peace? The Sport for Development and Peace Movement, SDP Movement, is abbreviated. And the whole idea of this movement is, uh, as I said, it's increased a lot. And all around the world, you will find organizations that are sports organizations or not sports organizations that use sports as a tool in development work. It can be in Africa or in South America, or it can be in, in Oslo. It can be in, in London. Around the Olympics, uh, an Olympic bid usually has a development goal to improve the standards or to raise awareness, etc., uh, etc. Et so this is an increasingly um, interesting area, both in the theory and in practice. Um, but this is not a new area, although it seems to be. And my work and in my research, I've been looking at <coughs> the Norwegian initiative, or the Norwegians um, when they st or when NIF started to do their sport for development work in Africa. This happened in the 1980s, and I've been looking at uh, how or why Norway involved in sport for development work. Uh, why on earth? thinking that uh, Norway should, okay, it's okay to go there and give um, and um, say that we want to create social development. We give sports like they do now, but in Norway they, they actually tried to, to take a Norwegian model and just implement it in Tanzania. So I've been looking at, are there any problems when it comes to these things? And can it be related to what's happening today? Um, so the, so the Sport for Development and Peace movement looks at how they can use sport to provide social um, development, so to speak. And interesting, interestingly enough, peace. I think peace is there for political reasons. <laughs> I think peace is there because it's, uh, it's kind of trendy also in uh, the world of sports to think about peace now. And we have, for instance, in Norway, they <coughs> initiated this handshake of peace that you should do on the arena. Um, we won't talk more about that, but it's definitely for political reasons. Um, I don't know if they're trying to go for a peace prize or something like the IOC did in the 50s, uh, but it's, um, it's part of a, a political agenda. We can also ask, is this idealism or is this imperialism? Critics will say that this way of doing sports, not necessarily only for development reasons, but this way of implementing sport in a different country, part of globalization as we talked about, it is not unproblematic and may be a part of uh, the new imperialism. Imperialism meaning what? You remember that? What was imperialism? We 
we're going to just quickly saying, say that. Europe, in the 1800s and 1900s, big powers, Great Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, <laughs> and for instance, Africa, the case of Africa, this is in 1914, they just took it and decided it between each other, who, sh who should have what. So Britain took a big lump here, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Egypt, Sudan, France. Why does everybody in, in West Africa speak, fr speak French? They were under France. They were under French flag. Why do they speak um, Spanish? Well, that's actually mostly here. They speak Pan Spanish. Portuguese in, Anjo in Angola, Mozambique. They were under Portuguese flag or govern governed by. So this is a politics that characterized 1800s and 1900s. And it's very central, for instance, in Africa, which I've studied, the roots of imperialism is still there. there these, are, um, uh, these are independent nations now, but it's still there, more or less. And we see that through the way we're practicing sports. They play, um, they play um, uh, rugby and cricket in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. They were under British rule. So it's, um, it's uh, what recognizes this, this kind of politics. Um, and when we then talk about cultural imperialism, it will be the same idea that it's a dominance. It's not a financial dominance, but it's also on a social and cultural uh, level. And as I said, uh, some people will say that bringing sports all across the world will be cultural imperialism. <coughs> They're trying to take over the world. Some people will say bringing Marlboro all over the world is cultural imperialism or Americanization, as they say. But then also, what I've been looking at, critics will say doing what Norway did in the 1980s will be cultural imperialism. Bringing a mindset of Norwegian sports to Africa saying, hey, do like we do. It's so much better for you. We don't really know you, but it, we think because it works here. This STP has a history. Sport has been used as colonial politics. Uh, many colonies used sport not only to control the colonies, but to create contact between the colonizers, we could say, the imperial lords and the people. And they used, um, um, they used sport to, yeah, to create contact and to, and to become friends with uh, the ones they were set to govern. Uh, but also sports were used as, as a sort of a force, but it seems most uh, evidence shows that it wasn't necessarily forced upon people to do sports, but it was more even used as an exclusive, excluding mechanism that people came, say, from Britain and they brought tennis and they fenced their tennis course because this was pastime. They wanted to do this on their own and, and they um, actively tried to, to keep other people outside. But um, there might be traces of sport development in colonial politics. Olympic solidarity, which they gave to talked about that yesterday. The Olympic movement, they have their own solidarity program, which is to assist national government, no, national organization, national Olympic committees um, with money so that they can send athletes to the Olympics or train their athletes. Um, Kubata, this is Kubata, who invented the modern Olympic Games. He was very clear on what he thought about sport as a way to civilize people. He said that, um, that uh, we, have to, um, we have to use sport um, to, to conquer the African continent because this is the final battle of sports conquest of the world. 
the final battle stands in Africa. So they, they didn't know, he claimed in 1923, they didn't know the Olympic sports. So they needed to let them know the Olympic sports so that they could be included in the big happy Olympic family. This can be sport development. Also in wartime, sport was used. Cold War uh, era, I don't know how much you know about that. I won't stop that long about, uh, with it, but sport were used mostly for political reasons to create contact and, uh, and, um, and uh, actually so that people will sympathize with their political system. Uh, and we might say that this was sport development, aid or SDP. The early development aid or sport development was centered towards the elites. And that's a big difference from what they do now, right? Now you go for children or youth that are not necessarily sports people because sport is, not, is a tool, it's not the aim necessarily. And this you know about, sport for all. Who's got that as his motto, as their motto? Myth. True. Sport for all is a mantra in Norwegian sport, but also in Europe. That was very important. In the European Council, they stated that sport was a human right. Um, and that, of course, makes it... Uh, uh, an important uh, issue to follow that up, to give everybody the opportunity to do sports, as well as um, it legitimizes your own, um, your own uh, ideas of spreading your own mindset. This picture is from uh, Tanzania in 1982. This is the Norwegian queen, Queen Sonia. She was a crown princess then. And these are all Norwegians. They were there to kickstart a Norwegian sport for all project in 1982 in Tanzania in Dar es Salaam, uh, which NIF started um, yeah, in 82 and it uh, went on throughout the 80s until 1981. My study uh, has been on this particular project as well as another project that they continued in the 90s in Zimbabwe and is still going on. <coughs> and what I have looked at is, because I'm curious, why, why did NIF want to do this? Why, why this of all things? Uh, Norwegians didn't know much about African sport from what they, like, they knew from the media and everything. But, and coming to different contexts. Have you been to Tanzania? or any, any of the South Saharan Africa countries, Southern Sahara, South, no? Um, it's quite a different system. <coughs> it's a different political system. It's a different um, way of thinking, mentality. Uh, it's a different sport system. And sport, we talked about culture. Sport has a different status. Uh, the way we think about sports is different. And we've been talking a lot about the way we Norwegians think about sport. I don't know if you uh, in Germany or France relate to the way we talk about sport or you think it's different from your countries. Uh, it's probably not that different. But if you think in a, in a whole different context, which is quite different from ours, it is, um, it is kind of interesting that Norway or NIF uh, found out that they should just start sports for all in, in Tanzania. And that was my starting point when I started my project here. Why did they do this? What was this project? And more importantly, maybe, uh, what did people in Tanzania think about this? Or at least in retrospect, what do they think about it now? When it's a historical study, it's always difficult <laughs> to know what they actually thought then. But wh what are their ideas about this now? 
What was it that Norway did in Tanzania in the 1980s? I won't um, go into detail here. You see it's a bit mix <laughs> of English and Norwegian. The idea is that, first of all, NIF in the 1980s could start a development project in Africa because of development politics, Bistans Politik. And they granted more money to NGOs, <coughs> you know the word NGOs, non-governmental organizations? Uh, and NGOs could be granted money to go through with projects. So NIF did this, first of all, because they could. They were given money to it. Second of all, and we've been talking about that here too, Norwegian uh, mindset to sport is changing. Sport is becoming more important to more people. The whole idea of sport for all is setting root in Norway. So the idea this is important is very, it's very evident. And the last one, the last important part is that the other Nordic countries did the same. And in development politics and any other things more or less, Norway is kind of, uh, especially towards Sweden, we like to do the same as they do. Uh, <coughs> we are competing, but we're also looking a little bit up to Sweden, I think. We have more or less the same political system, social dem democratic system. So what they do, a plan, at least in development uh, politics, is much what we can, uh, can relate to. I won't say that it was a, a copy of what they were supposed to do in Sweden, but a little bit. So if you see, if you know the Nordic uh, flags, this is Tanzania. Norway initiated a project in Dar es Salaam. Sweden in Arusha. This is the Kilimanjaro mountain. Maybe some of you will go there one day. Denmark had a cultural project in once, a little bit different from the two others. And Finland in Matuara. These three projects were sport for all projects meaning that they were using the idea of sport for all that was very strong in the European uh, system and they were implementing, trying to implement the idea of sport for all in Tanzania. Needless to say, this was of course challenging because the idea of sport for all, the sport for, we're talking 1980, the idea of women in Dar es Salaam um, running in the streets. Dar es Salaam is a Muslim capital or a Muslim city. In the 1980s was kind of way off. Um, but this is what they attempted to do. I won't go into detail here but basically <coughs> they wanted to implement the organization similar to that of NIF uh, to strengthen physical education in schools produce sports equipment and uh, to teach them how to run sports. And the objective, which is very important, always in a project you need to have an objective. The goal is that they should continue the project after it ended. What do we do in sports and sport management in order for sustainability to be the goal? This is an open question. If you want to implement a project amongst, not necessarily an African population, but uh, if you want to implement a project in your local sport club, we talked about this under volunteerism, I remember. What is one of the most important things you do? You have a great idea. You want it to be implemented in the sport club. <coughs> Do you just go ahead on your own? I'm looking for people that also uh, like, would like to support the idea. Yeah, you look for people who support the idea. That's a, a good starting point. And get people on your side, right? But what then if, uh, if uh, many people or almost the whole club says, yeah, this is a good idea, but what if we do it this way instead? 
What do you do? Do you try to adapt, maybe? Especially when it's the club that should carry the project after you're gone, right? <laughs> you probably know what I'm, I'm uh, fishing for here. But the, the, when the recipients should be able to continue the project, that's it. And, and in order to create sustainability in a project like this, or in any project, it's important to have the people on your side. <laughs> or to have the same understanding <coughs> as the ones that you want to implement this project amongst. And that relates to current uh, situations too. Um, and in development, uh, we talk about ownership. And that is a very important um, key word in order to create sustainability. If there is a new visionary person coming into a sport club saying that we all need to do this because this is great and I did that in my own club. Unless you create enthusiasm, people who want to pull in the same direction and ownership that people feel that this is actually our idea together, it's likely that when that person leaves the club or get injured or whatever, this is going to fall apart. But if you create this kind of ownership, we're pulling this load together. Which also sometimes means that you have to uh, go away from some of your initial ideas. Then it's likely to continue. I think this is relevant for anyone who will run a sport club eventually. And you probably know that. You can do a whole lot on your own. You can do more together. But then you have to compromise sometimes. Nah, this is a... Uh, martial arts, I can just kick the butt. <laughs> yeah. Oppa. Yeah, we don't have to look at this. But the same here. Um, eventually they went to Zimbabwe. They were going with the same idea of Sport for All and the Norwegian model. We were talking a little bit about that and we discussed it the other day with some historians that we don't really know what the <laughs> if the Norwegian model should be a term like that, but we still use it. Uh, the way of organizing sport in Norway as the ideal for everyone. So why did we want to do this in Norway? First of all, they thought that they had something good to contribute. Our way of organizing sport is brilliant. And in Africa, Tanzania, it's not. So we have something to contribute. That's the first argument. And then it's also an argument that we can learn from the developing countries. We can learn about from their ways of doing sports. And the funny thing is when they talk about what they can learn, it's usually things that has to do something with the rhythm skills, the way of dancing, these kind of stereotypes that I think some of you also, uh, if you don't have them, at least you know about them or they're subjected to them. If you have, um, a team in Norway Cup coming from Kenya or Tanzania. You often see them on the stages and uh, on the stage and they are dancing their traditional dances. Do we really think that they're going around dancing their traditional dances all the time? If I go to Africa, am I expected to bring uh, a violin and dance hulling dance? No. I'm not. It's our stereotypes that tells us that everybody loves, <laughs> and maybe they do, maybe many people love to, <laughs> to dance, but it's still the way we view the world that is problematic. And that's very, it was very evident in what I found here, that this, this uh, romanticized way of African sport was coming through in all the documents. Oh, they have a very uh, natural way of moving. Okay, maybe they did. Uh, and that was what we can learn about. They're not as stiff as us, uh, but our system but with less stiffness would be good. This is also an important argument for doing STP and still is. We talked about peace as a political tool. 1980s, what was the biggest problem in sport? Well, in Norway, it was the amateur rule. I don't know if you remember this uh, 
between the being a professional and amateur, but we're talking about money, the flow of money and, uh, pro and professionalization in sports. And uh, conservative sources would say that that is not a good development. All of a sudden, money is taking over. The market is taking over. And with that comes all the other ugly things, such as doping and black money and scandals. And then you have all these tragic incidents around the 1980s with the uh, uh, stadion, stadion, sta stadion scandal. <laughs> All those things that brought, and hooliganism, all those things that brought sports in a very bad light. In Norway, they were very, very open to that, this way of working, going to Africa, doing social work through sports, may refle reflect very well in sports itself. It will benefit us. Uh, politicians will see that we are trying. And especially when this pro project is aiming for women and children and the poorest of the poor. <coughs> and then this is also very important in Norway and we won't talk, I won't go into detail about the Norwegian welfare state and I don't even know if you remember this, but after the World War II, uh, the rebuilding of Norway as a welfare state is like the success recipe uh, of Norwegian after uh, what do you say, after World War II politics. And that era from 45-50 until the 70s, when we found, they found the oil, uh, is uh, marked in Norwegian history as the rebuilding era and also a welfare state. Uh, going from uh, nothing, more or less, or being a, a poor society, to becoming a wealthy society with all these welfare state uh, politics that we also see today. Um, sick leave and uh, money and all those kinds of things. And that was the idea that SDP through sports, Norway could help build a, a Tanzanian social democratic welfare state. And the way it was portrayed was of course that sport is in lack of everything here. They have nothing here. And this uh, only Tanzanian sport doctor that says, oh, I, would, I wish I had a, a um, stationary bike. Uh, so the, it was portrayed as a, as a in total lack of everything, which could only be solved by Norwegian sport, basically. Very fancy. What's happening? So when I talked to the recipients about five, six years ago, they told me, for instance, that Sport for All was introduced to the National Sports Council. Here we have an idea. We want you to start a project known as Sport for All. And these are the objectives and the way to go through. And we want you to go into these areas. And we want these kind of people to deal with. And we have this to offer, so we need your backing up. And we need you to go with us to help this be organized and done. Who seems to be the setting the terms of this aid? This is a Tanzanian person speaking. Who decided the terms of the Norwegian aid to Tanzania? Norway. Norway. How is it easy to, is it easy to uh, create sustainability then? To be on the terms of the recipient? If these are the terms, we want these kind of people, we want to aid women and children, we have to do that because that's why we get money. And we want to be in Tanzania, we have to be in a rural area because that there are most people there so that we will um, benefit as many people as possible because that is good on the statistics and then we'll have more money, etc., etc. Another one said, a wave came that, sp uh, that said sport for all. Nobody sat down and said, what do you actually want? And looking at um, uh, research from around this time, in developing countries, which they were termed at that time, it was very evident that they wanted money or assistance for elite sports. Because they had the same discussion as we had or, and have, that maybe if we have good elite, that creates mass partic participation. Same, um, same ideas uh, going on there as it did here. 
But in Norway, we had def defined their need and, their uh, and what they needed. And that was an elite sport. Norway would never get money for an elite project, and they still wouldn't. If NIF applied to Norwegian government today and said, we want money because we want to have a football academy in Ghana, they would never get money. That's elite sport. So that was the terms of the Norwegian government's aid. You can have money if it goes to children and women and differently abled in Tanzania. But nobody asked Tanzania what they want. They just assumed that they wanted sport for all. And then, of course, we can talk about this power relationship that Norway kind of just imposed sport in Tanzania, but Norway, NIF, was also subject to kind of a power relation between their funders, NURAD. Bottom line, in this development politics, <coughs> and increasingly so, we're talking politics <coughs> and uh, pulling the, the right, what do you say, straws or whatever. Another former secretary said, this was a package from the owners of the project introduced to us for acceptance. Here we have a plan, just take it. It involves money, and it involves activity, so it's better. And the owners of the project's project was NIF. It wasn't National Sport Council. It was a bit of people were made to believe that there is a gift from Norway also very problematic in development terms. There's a gift from Norway. You need to accept your gift, of course. You don't, you don't say no thank you to a gift. Have you ever said no to a gift? You accept it. Okay, okay, we can take it. There's money involved. They were made to be recipient. With no other role than saying thank you and being happy about this. Thank you very much for this um, very, very grateful, uh, I'm very grateful for, you, for this gift. That was the impression that they were given. This is the recipient speaking. Again, a lot of criticism to NIF this. Um, who was to own this? Was the initiator or the recipient? The same as uh, we talked about with if you're starting a, a club or initiating something. Who should own this? After the initiator went, the people in the receiving end didn't know what to do. There was something seriously wrong, and there was no money then. There was no more money flowing in. And if you have a, a project that is not sustainable, only driven by money, of course uh, it won't sustain. And that's one of the biggest problems with this uh, Tanzanian project, because it was very good. Much of it was very good. They created a lot of, uh, of, um, of uh, what do you say, activity. And much of it is seen, even today, although the project, as it was intended, didn't go on. But you still have, you can still see running groups around Dar es Salaam. You can still see um, some, uh, uh, what do you say, um, fruits <laughs> or, uh, or uh, some activities that are still going on that were started in this period. But the problem isn't that there was no activity. The problem is that the project was never a Tanzanian project. Because Norway had an idea, and still have an idea in Zimbabwe, about sport for all, which was super important in Norway and need to be super important for everyone else. And then we just moved it somewhere else. In this case, to Tanzania. This is a... This is a different. Nineteen ninety five. NIF is in Zimbabwe. They need more money for the project. They're going to uh, extend their, their project there. On every level, sport is in complete lack of competence. It is still necessary to be in control of the funds and make sure that the progress goes according to plan. Attempts to pressurize efforts to get sport for integrated in all official plans, among other things, to try to secure future governmental financial allocations, 
transfer competence and knowledge from NIF to all levels of sports are considered very important for NIF. It's not difficult to agree in this case. That is probably right. Don't you think? Probably in Norwegian or West European terms, they don't have that competence. We're talking about professionalized sports. We're talking about that next time. Yes, there are less uh, competent, in theory, competent people, probably. Uh, but still, it's very problematic in a relation like this. We made this, our, this line where we put ourselves in a different, uh, in a different uh, stage. It's very problematic to talk about uh, controlling other people. In, this, uh, in these terms. Um, and the idea of directly transfer competence and knowledge from a Norwegian way of looking at sport to a whole different system is problematic. And Zimbabwe, even more so maybe than, than Tanzania, uh, was um, or is a society uh, that is undergoing extreme challenges. I don't know how much you know about Zimbabwe. They used to be the, they called it the um, the, um, the most <laughs> brain storage, uh, the most prosperous country in Africa in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was the most, uh, and uh, the Western, Western countries looked to Zimbabwe for their educational system, for instance. And then they had a president who was uh, an independence or f with a, a sol soldier of uh, gain, or they gained independence under this soldier. What's the name of the president in Zimbabwe? Robert Mugabe has been a president since 1980. And uh, from being a hero of his country and his people, many still consider him a, a big hero because he was the one who, together with his troops, of course, who freed Zimbabwe from, uh, from British rule. Uh, and that was pretty late in the 80s. But still, um, from being that, he kind of, I, I realize I say this on tape, but he kind of lost it. <laughs> And now Zimbabwe is suffering huge financial problems and huge um, uh, political problems. And the people there are suffering enormously. Coming there with a, an idea of sport, implementing sport and the sport system. And now we can move a little bit away from this development and peace, using sports to inform people about HIV, AIDS, how to be a social entrepreneur, etc. But coming with a system or a model saying, this is what you need, do exactly the same as us. And then maybe you can climb this ladder too. It's definitely problematic. And I see I don't have time to talk about <laughs> this last topic, but I hope I introduced you a little bit to some ideas about um, the globalization of sport and the problems related to this. Not necessarily uh, dangerous that the sport is, or that sport is globalized, but you need to know that in this whole setting of all these great things happening to global sport, there are problematic uh, issues, or there are things that might be questioned and should be questioned, because much of it is helping to sustain uh, a power imbalance between the West, Western world, if we can say that, and the rest of the world. And that power balance is, first of all, very uneven. And second of all, the gap, as we also saw with the goods industry, the gap is getting bigger and bigger often. So although globalization as a good, is a good idea because it can bring everyone together and win one big, happy, sporty family, it also creates tensions and gaps. That will be my last word today. Next time is the last time and um, we will talk about professionalization of sport. 
We will have uh, Tari Nustran Jakobsen from MFK, MFK. He will come and he will talk about the professionalization of MFK as a football club, going from uh, uh, or going towards a professional or even more professional organization. So um, that's about it. I will look at these um, these um, karahata. Yeah. Arbetskraft. This weekend.